Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be continuing my uh, Latvian Literature Week with what I guess I'm calling What I Learned in Latvia. So, I have a few of my notes here and various other bits and bobs, and I'm going to do my best to talk you through what I learned. Let me, let me just check, because this is my little travel notebook. Yeah, so we arrived at the hotel on the Tuesday night, Tuesday the 6th of March. Wednesday the 7th of March, we met up in the, the lobby of the hotel, and then we went to the uh, Latvian National Library. And so I wrote a few things there, because we were given a tour, you see, by the, by the guy there. So, for example, we learned that 2018 will be the 100th centenary of Latvia as a country. And the library was actually formed the year after, in 1919. So 2019 will be the 100th anniversary of the library. The current library was designed in 1989, but it wasn't actually, you know, officially uh, launched and built and whatnot until the 21st century. It was opened in 2014. The architect was Latvian America. He was called uh, Gunnars Burkertz, I think. I think I, I can never pronounce his name correctly. They have uh, 500 events a year there with lectures and conferences and all that stuff. They do have a full conference hall. They've got 3D printers, VR headsets, all this stuff. The concert hall has got 460 seats. And I wrote down here, it costs 150 million euros and has 14 floors. One of the things I did like there is they have a uh, wall of books. It's called the People's Bookshelf. And basically anyone from anywhere in the world can send a book in that means something to them. So I will be sending in a book. Uh, I will try and leave the link below to where you can do that if you want to send a book of your own. And they said um, they quite often get, you know, visiting politicians and dignitaries and that kind of thing will bring a book along as well. They recently had their millionth visitor as well, and I asked if they gave them anything, they said they gave them a cake. So despite the fact that Latvia as a country didn't exist until 1918, Riga was founded in 1201, it used to be a trading port, and um, you can really tell there's a lot of buildings in the, in the city that are older than the country, which is a very strange feeling, especially when you come from the United Kingdom as well, you know. Back to the library, the average stay duration is three hours, and while we were there, after we had our tour, we had some presentations, so we had... Uh, Presentation on Latvia by the Latvian Institute by Ieva Stare. We had, and then we had contemporary Latvian literature by Iveta Ratanika, and she's a literary critic. So a few notes I wrote down there. So um, again, obviously because of 50 years of Soviet oppression in Latvia, it's kind of still in its adolescence as a country. And um, but folk songs basically connect them to the past. And I also wrote down there kind of a form of storytelling too, which is fascinating. But Folk songs had been passed around through the different tribes and that sort of thing, the people in the area, since long before the country itself was a country. So that's why the folk songs are so important. They kind of give them that grounding to the past. They describe themselves as pagans as well. They're, they said that they're, they're, being close to nature is important to the Latvian soul. And a lot of that is because, I mean, it's, you know, 50% woodland or something. Uh, you know, people are, they have, uh, you know, midsummer festivals and fertility festivals and these kind of things. Especially the midsummer festival is basically an excuse for everyone to go into the forest and have sex with each other. The guy, one of the guys we were talking to, he said, um, because of the midsummer festival, he has so many friends whose birthdays are in February and March that, you know, it's like 80% of his friends are born in those two months because it's nine months after the fertility festival. So he said the typical Latvian wants to live alone in a homestead in a country with no neighbors, but the folk stuff helps to bring them together with a national identity. So although they can be quite introverted and, you know, they want to live by themselves, the folk stuff does all bring them together as well. All of the folk costumes are handmade and unique. They're almost a business card for, you know, for, for women who are looking for a, you know, a husband. You know, they can show... Uh, this sounds really kind of... Um, you know what I mean? It sounds, it sounds very sort of old-fashioned in that respect. But actually, it's a really, you know... It's not old-fashioned at all in terms of its approach to men and women. So it's over 50% of leadership positions in Latvia are held by women. So yeah, every five years they form the biggest choir in the world. So there's going to be 40,000 people for the uh, centenary celebration. There's also a cemetery festival once a year where people basically come together to remember the dead. But they did make, you know, they made it quite clear that it's not a morbid thing. It's quite... Um, you know, it's a beautiful thing. It's something that brings you together with your family. Riga itself has been described as the world capital of Art Nouveau. It's got the, the second largest heritage of wooden architecture among European capitals. Uh, about two million people just under living in Latvia. So everyone in the country kind of has to pull their weight. And um, fun fact as well is that 
the original Christmas tree, the first one in documentation, uh, was in Riga. It, Riga itself has been described as the world capital of Art Nouveau. It's, it's got the, the second largest heritage of wooden architecture among European capitals. Uh, about two million people just under living in Latvia. So everyone in the country kind of has to pull their weight. And um, fun fact as well is that the original Christmas tree, the first one in documentation, uh, was in Riga. It was in Riga for the winter solstice in 1510. It talks a lot about birch sap as well, so it's uh, it's kind of used similarly to uh, maple syrup, I guess, in a way. It's kind of a national, uh, it's a national drink as kind of a detox or an energy boost. And uh, it's also used in cosmetics, tastes like slightly sweet water. Food is obviously quite important there as well. So last year, Latvia was the first country to hold the title of the European Region of Gastronomy. But the country itself is all about taking the old to build the new. And we, we saw that a lot in the authors we, we looked at. Again, you need to know some of the folk stories and the history of the country to make sense of what people are writing about today. I'd argue that's the same with many countries. It's the same with, you know, if you're reading an American book, it does help to know a little bit about, you know, America and democracy and, you know, guns. We were told as well people often do what I personally would really like to do which is to retreat to the country and live in a cottage because uh, they have kind of super fast broadband all over the country as well so they can do that especially if they do what I do and work online. I could I could live in a, in a little cottage in the Latvian countryside. It's actually quite a techie country as well so we were told about Air Dog which is a drone that follows you so if you're doing extreme sports, you're skiing for example then this drone will automatically follow you. There are also two Latvian entrepreneurs on on the Forbes 30 under 30 list and actually both of them are female as well so there's Alice Semyonova of Infogram and Sabine Pohl from Sorry as a Service and the country has a 99.9% .9 literacy rating as well. Because the state used to control people and now people have a vote they exercise it people want to make things happen so a great example of that is actually the Latvian Freedom Statue which was kind of crowdfunded entirely from donations from the people. Some people have said well maybe they were told donate or else but you know other things include a great example of um, basically somebody wanted a bike lane and there'd been people campaigning for bike lanes for ages and the government never got around to doing it. So somebody just went out and painted their own bike lane on one of the roads and the next day the traffic just all obeyed it. I've got some more notes down here as well about what makes Latvian literature unique. So, um, well, Iveta Ratanika, she told us, uh, due to historic, cultural and political circumstances, the timelines of several literary movements and trends in Latvian literature differ from those of the West. So romanticism is still big, especially in Latvian poetry. Uh, there was a big boom of poetry in the middle of the 20th century, mostly in the 1960s. Obviously, it was under Soviet rule at the time. You could kind of write what you wanted, but you had to realize that if you published it, you might get yourself in trouble. You might get sent to Siberia, put into a gulag, that kind of thing. Uh, poetic form was normal, so, you know, writing in specific types of poetry, and whereas avant-garde belonged to the elite rather than the people. It says, um, Soviet rule was actually efficient for the development of poetry, even if not for the poets themselves. And part of that is because, for example, it became big business to write poetry that would go in greetings cards or on gravestones. So people were exposed to poetry more, but it was kind of a form of propaganda in and of itself. So it was good for poetry, bad for the actual poets. And we were told a poet was expected to be national tribune, historian, caretaker of politics, ethics, even ecology, with a strong respect for folklore and language. So we also talked about the fate of some of the poets. So I've got here uh, Skujanix was sent to Siberia. Rock Pelnes came out as a KGB agent. They said as well, the typical protagonist is a strong Latvian woman versus the universe. One book that I noted down that I want to get is Doom 94 by Janis Jonevs and uh, that's basically about metalheads getting drunk and going to Doom metal concerts, which sounds amazing. From there we went to a restaurant called Ritz, which was nice, and then we went to a place called The Nice Place, which is basically a Latvian bookshop but it's also a coffee shop, you could use it as a workspace, they even had a printing press there, it was great. And that's when we were presented uh, the Platform Latvian Literature presentation by Jutta Parago, who is one of our hosts there. And they were just telling us a bit more about what Latvia is planning at London Book Fair this year. By the way, if you're going to London Book Fair, let me know, because I will also be going. Basically, there are a few different organisations involved in that. So there's the Latvian Literature Platform, International Writers and Translators House, the Latvian Writers Union and the Latvian Publishers Association. And they kind of teamed up because they realised they all do pretty much a similar thing. 
and so they wanted to make a big splash at book fair. They all right, I went for a while because I was losing my voice, but I'm back now. Let me get the flag. So some other things we learned was that translating prose is much easier than translating poetry. Part of the reasons for that is because basically poetry often has double meanings or complex metaphors, that kind of thing that don't necessarily translate one way to the other. You can't really do it literally. They did, though, run a very cool looking workshop where they got uh, British people over. So they had some English people and some Welsh speakers and they were translating between English, Welsh and Latvian. I will link below, actually, because there's a video of that. And um, they were saying it's not a word for word translation. It's, it's more like um, more like an interpretation. The way I see it is more like a cover song. So it's not the, it's the same song, but a different interpretation of it, you know. And Latvian literature are on YouTube, so again, I will link to them below and you can check that out. They have a newsletter as well. Then we learned about the I Am Introvert campaign, which was presented by Una Rosenbaumer. And um, she said there's a, a Latvian saying that is, stop shouting, you're not in a forest. And basically, Latvian people as a whole tend to be quite introverted, which is part of the reason, I think, why they invited us over to try and help, you know, spread the word on their behalf, I suppose. This is also the day I went shopping for this, so we had a little time to go around. We met some uh, authors at the Nice Place. One of them was a poet who was about my age, which was very interesting. Then we went to the book launch, or book opening as they called it, which is a great way to call it. Uh, and we went to the launch of Soviet Milk by Nora Ekstena, which I've bought a copy of somewhere. This was around about the time as well. I learned that writers, especially during the Soviet era, used to quite often be like night watchmen or firemen. And I think that's an interesting contrast to sort of here in the UK where they just, I guess, became local newspaper men and stuff like that. That uh, place where we went for dinner, actually, they were playing Beatles constantly as well and I thought it was a bit weird that they, they played back in the USSR as one of them which you know Latvia most definitely is not but anyway on to Thursday so Thursday morning we went on a tour of Riga's old town and uh, that was fascinating we had this fantastic tour guide he quite often would tell us the stories behind things and then tell them that that's actually not the real story uh, and you know I quite like that I like to hear those those touristy stories without having to also fall for them and believe in things that aren't real we also, what else did we have then? We went to the Museum of the Occupation of Latvia, which was, again, it's just really an incredible history. I mean, like I think I mentioned earlier in this video, I'm getting confused now. I've filled so many of these videos today that I can't remember what I've said in what video, and I think I'm repeating myself, but, you know. Um, but the Museum of the Occupation of Latvia, it was so fascinating that it was actually in a temporary building at the moment because they're redoing the main building. But basically, they were invaded by the Germans, then the Russians, then the Germans during World War II. And, you know, there was like a big Latvian diaspora, or however you pronounce that word. And uh, as well, lots of people died, obviously. Lots of stuff was ruined. And um, it was just really fascinating to learn about it. And equally, to learn about how they then regained their independence as well um, in the 1990s. Then we went for lunch. And then we went back to Robert's Books, which was this awesome little bookshop. And we had a presentation on the book market in Latvia by Renata Punka from the Publishers Association. And one of the big things that stood out from that to me is that uh, there was a, a VAT increase from 5% to 20% and that affected book sales really badly. After that, we went for uh, dinner with a translator and a literary agent as well, which was fascinating. And then we went to see a band called Sigma, who were really very good. And what they do very well is that they take Latvian poetry and they set it to music and, um, you know, sing it as they're like a kind of an indie band. And um, yeah, they were, they were really good. I enjoyed that. It was interesting as well because one of the girls was sitting on the end and translating all the song titles for us as well. So that takes us up to Friday the 9th of March. And um, you may notice, by the way, as the week went on, I took fewer notes because there's just so much to take in. Yeah, it was really cool that we watched a little film called The Kiosk by Anita McClake, McClary. I can't read my handwriting, but I'll try and link to that below as well. And that's about a well-known uh, kiosk in Riga. And basically the plot is this woman who's running it decides she wants to move elsewhere. We also learned about a lot of the different jobs the illustrators had. So um, Anna Valvare was an architect, for example. Uh, who else did we have? We had Rainus Peterson. He was one of the only, if not the only, full-time illustrator in Latvia. He actually drew me a fridge magnet as well, which is very nice of him. Uh, another one was a fashion designer. I think one was, a, yeah, one was a sculptor. So it was quite cool seeing how they, you know, monetize their skills, I suppose. 
Then from there we went to meet the Orbiter group, who are this Russian group of uh, Russian-speaking Latvian poets. And um, they were fascinating guys. There were only three of the four of them there, but some of the different stuff they've done. They ran a pirate radio station. They uh, run a spoken word festival. They put on installations. So they did uh, a sonnet made out of objects, for, for example. And they also did an installation where you walk along uh, like a bank of radios. And as you walk from radio to radio, you hear different parts of different poems and so you get a unique experience each time and they were fascinating and, and th this place we went to mr. page um, it was um, <laughs> it was this really unique bookshop they pick out all the books by hand they actually said one of the best parts of being in running a bookshop is that they get to buy all these books without feeling guilty if they don't read them but they specifically think of people when they're buying them so they'll be like oh you know Joe likes this kind of thing so let's get that in but then joe comes into the shop and he picks it up without even realizing that they picked it specifically for him so it's quite like it makes me think of the difference between going to a supermarket and going to you know a local business it's that kind of vibe but with a bookshop which i think is great after that we had some free time so i went on a walk around the city and then we went from there to inga garley's poetry launch which was uh, 30 questions people don't ask Again, that was fascinating. Got to meet the poet. She was reading in both Latvian and English, which was a lot of fun. I also bought a few souvenirs while I was there, which you'll see in my haul video. And from there, we went to a restaurant and then back to the to the bar. So I did become conscious during this that I don't want to repeat myself too much. So hopefully I haven't done that. But I just wanted to share a few of my notes and further thoughts on uh, my trip to Latvia, I suppose. So. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed this video and that it didn't just become me rambling. And um, yeah, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this. Subscribe for more bookish content and I will see you soon for another bookish video, including more Latvian week videos later this week. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.